Okay, thank you very much for the invitation. I hope you have all noticed that this is not the title of my talk. The title of my talk is, uh, assuming that this thing works, let's see. Now it has decided not to work. I think I have to click again here. Right. The title of my talk is not how to give a talk, but how I give a talk. So I've been giving talks for about 30 years. So I think uh, there are a couple of things that I have learned in the process, but I don't claim they are useful for everyone. They are universal advice, but I will pretend they are universal advice because otherwise it's very boring to be repeating every 10 seconds, in my opinion or whatever. So uh, the first thing is, should you care? Is it so important to give good talks? Uh, probably many people have the impression that, okay, it's not so important. The important thing is to have good results and everything else will come uh, just by itself. And uh, I think in particular, most PhD students underestimate the importance of good talks. And the problem is that they usually tend to overestimate uh, the, uh, what other people know. So when you are starting as a PhD student and you go to a conference, you think that everybody is very clever, that they know a lot, that they know about your area, that they maybe even have read your paper. And uh, actually all that is uh, actually a wrong assumption. Very few people have, uh, very few people read your papers. If uh, very few people in particular read your papers in any detail. And in fact, it's going to be the case that most people know your work only through your talks. Actually, if you have already been to a conference, think yourself, what do you remember of a conference? When you come back from a conference and somebody asks you, yeah, what happened there? What was good? Probably what you are going to say is, oh, this guy gave a very nice talk. Oh, this other guy gave a very nice talk. That's what you remember. Uh, there is also an important thing that differentiates uh, giving talks from writing papers, and it is the snowball effect. You can be invited to give talks, but you know, the fact that you have published a conference in a paper will not get you an invitation to publish another paper in that conference, right? Uh, there is this snowball effect by which if you give good talks, then you will be invited first to give talks in seminars at uh, other universities. Then you will be invited to give talks at, at workshops. Then you will, you will be invited to give talks at conferences. So giving good talks allows you to reach actually uh, many more people with your, with your research. And then uh, there is uh, another important uh, point, which is uh, many of you, if you decide to stay in academia, in a few years, you will be facing a hiring committee. And uh, I don't know if you know how hiring committees work, uh, because I didn't know when I started. But for example, in a hiring committee, you are not only going to have experts who know about your work. Only that you, there will be a few. Right. And they, well, whether they know about your work is not this question. You, you cannot be sure of that, but they may have had a look at your papers or they may know you from, from other, from, from conferences. Right. But definitely there are going to be people there who don't know you. For example, there is always a representative from another faculty, or if the, uh, if the hiring committee is accepting applications from different areas, then there will be experts in other areas that don't know you. There will be representatives from the students, there will be representatives, uh, women representative. Those people, they don't know you. And then their first impression uh, you, you make is with your talk. I mean, the most probably the most important one. And you know, if your CV is much better than the CV of any other person in the any other candidate, then you will get the position. But that's rarely the case, in particular, if the position is, for example, open to people from different areas. And then other matters start to be start to have a lot of influence, for example, the quality of your talk. So now, assuming that I have convinced you that uh, talks are important and maybe you should invest more time in them. For example, when I have to give an important talk, I start about three, four weeks before uh, already. I don't know about you. Uh, that's that's my, my kind of uh, rule of thumb. So uh, I think the most important question that you should ask yourself when you are thinking about uh, how could I give good talks is who are you? And what are you doing when you are giving a talk? And if you observe people giving talks at conferences, you will see that there are different models. So uh, some people, oops, oh, sorry. Ah, let's see. Some people are newscasters reporting on results. So they try to be objective and they, they appear a bit detached from what they are saying. Very often they don't move very much from their laptop. Okay, and they are just trying to be, trying to convince you that they are objective people telling you the truth, so to speak. 
Then there are lawyers who defend their papers, right? These are people, for example, that tell you very much about related work, telling you why this is not, why this is different from what everybody else did, um, possibly better, right? So they act as a lawyer defending the paper. You have, of course, the salesperson, right? I am sure you all have had this impression that some people maybe uh, are look like uh, they are trying to sell you their tool or their their program or, or, or their, their theorem. You also have another one which is very, uh, very common is so other people look like teachers, right? Or they, they think I am a teacher, the audience knows uh, uh, not so much about this as I do. And then uh, I am trying to convey knowledge, the knowledge that I have and they don't have, I'm trying to convey it to these persons. This is not so common among beginners because as I told you, beginners usually overestimate the knowledge of the audience, but then you also see this, this type of, of a speaker. Well, I can tell you that none of these types works for me. I don't want to be any of these. And in fact, I, I, when I am giving a talk, I, or when I am preparing a talk, I, I, I think, I look at myself and think, I am, being, I am looking like a teacher here. Am I looking like a, a newscaster here? So who do I want to be? Uh, what I want to be, the person I want to be, or what I want to be doing, is I want to be an actor telling a story. Now you may think, okay, fine, this is the kind of abstract advice that uh, is not going to bring me any farther, right? Uh, fine. Well, let me give you, for example, one immediate consequence of this, which is very specific. It's not, a, it's not a derivation from the fact that I am an actor. It comes from the fact this is probably the most important part. The part about the actor is not so important. The fundamental part is that you are telling a story. And, you know, if you go to the internet and search for how to give good presentations or something like that. Sooner or later, you are going to find this piece of advice. Tell them what you are going to tell them, then tell them, and then tell them what you told them. It's all over the place. You know, I Googled this sentence, uh, tell them what you are going to tell them. I look in images and I found this, and I found this, and I found this, and I found this. I found it attributed to Dale Carnegie. I found it uh, attributed to Tracy, uh, somebody called Tracy Markward. I found, by the way, a Wikipedia page saying that uh, those both, both those attributions are wrong, and it goes back to a preacher in the 19th century. Uh, the, 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 of course, the consequence that all these people are, are, are taking from this piece of advice is that you should structure your presentation in these three parts. Start with an introduction and an outline, then your core materials, and then you summarize your findings. Okay, if you are an actor telling a story, this piece of advice is, this is what I think about this piece of advice, right? It's total bullshit. And let me try to explain you why. Let me just do it by example. Let me try to uh, give a presentation following this advice. It is a presentation, so welcome to my presentation about the murder of Lord Borogov. And uh, I would like to start with an outline. Then, uh, first of all, I am going to tell you about the murder. I will tell you the circumstances of uh, the murder of Lord Borogov. Then I will introduce the suspects, Lady Borogov, Lord Borogov's nephew, Lady Borogov's lover, and the butler. Then I will describe the details of the inquiry and then I will present my main result. The murderer is the butler. And now let's start, right? So what you see is that you have given it all away. There is no interest from the audience anymore. This is an absolute spoiler, right? You are making it completely uninteresting for the audience. So the motor of a story is always the question, what's going to happen next? So I don't want to give it away with an outline. In fact, I have never given an outline to any of my presentations for at least 20 years. So does this mean, so if this is bullshit, if you should not use this structure, does this mean that you should use no structure at all? No, that's also wrong. I mean, talks should have some structure, but just not this one, one which is adequate to the idea of telling a story. In fact, if you go to, you, will, you, you can easily go to Wikipedia and find there a Wikipedia page on narrative structure. Of course, the people in the, in the humanities have uh, devoted lots of effort to studying which is the structure of stories. 
And stories also have three parts, but they are different parts, right? The first one is the setup, where you introduce the world of the hero and an inciting incident, something that destroys, for in a sense, or perturbs the world of the hero. The second part is then the confrontation, where the hero attempts to resolve the problem raised by the incident. But the very important thing is the hero does not succeed right away. Okay, it cannot yet uh, solve the problem. There has to be a process by which the story finds uh, gets to the resolution where in the climax scene, the hero finally solves the problem. So now, what does this mean when you translate it into our giving presentations at conferences? Well, of course, the setup corresponds to the motivation. You want to get the audience interested. But something which is very important is that this is not the same as convincing the audience that your work is important. People often think, oh, but my work uh, has no practical application, so I cannot have any motive. I don't have any motivation. That's rubbish. There is always an adequate motivation because the motivation does have, has nothing to do with convincing the audience that your work is important, but with convincing, with, with attracting the attention of the audience at this very moment. And how can you do that? Well, there are several techniques that uh, can, you can use, or that I use. One is, for example, start with a riddle. Try to find some things, a little problem, that uh, your audience will immediately understand, but that they cannot solve until you tell them something more about uh, what your results are. Start with a paradox, a puzzling fact, uh, for example, in in probability theory, it's usually very, uh, very easy to do this, right? So you all know the Monty Hall problem. This is a, a wonderful start for uh, any, any presentation on, on the basics of probability theory. Uh, of course, uh, it's, this is just so specific that it doesn't help you now for your next talk, but uh, the idea helps you hopefully. You can also just by, start by uh, describing a goal and describing an obstacle to that. So, you know, uh, for some years, people have been trying to prove this theorem, but there is this very fundamental obstacle that nobody was able to uh, overcome. Or, uh, and, and then this is, I am going to present you a roundabout way of doing so or something like that. Or, although that's what you do later, you don't say it right away. Uh, or you could also present a threat. For example, new results in cryptography tell us that uh, current cryptographic systems probably in a few years will be obsolete. What could we do in order to improve this, right? So uh, the important message that I want to convey here is that you should think very carefully about the setup, right? And then you should also think very carefully about the confrontation. And this is a, a point that I already made is the important thing is a confrontation is a struggle. So it's not, you don't, you cannot set the obstacle and then solve it right away, right? It's like a movie where the boy wants to get the girl and then just gets the girl, okay? No, there has to be a struggle. There have to be uh, some attempts that maybe don't, don't work. So it's important that you try to organize, for example, your proof or your algorithm in a, as a sequence of approximations, for example, this is something that I try to do very often. So I try to show fail attempts. It's not the only technique that you can use, but I think it's one that definitely matches the structure of the struggle. Okay, so you can give fail attempts at, the, at giving the right definition or the efficient algorithm or the right proof or something like that. So uh, it's also very useful to find an antagonist, try to uh, find, invent a character that is actually opposing you. Uh, very often you can do that when you are uh, presenting a proof, you know, by describing, okay, somebody, this colleague, so this, imagine that, uh, but now a colleague could come and object that this is not working because of this or that, but then actually we have this technique which uh, will solve the problem. Okay, and the resolution is the easy part. The resolution is what we all do when we present, okay, here is my proof, here is my result, I solve the problem. So that you don't have to say much about that. The beginner's mistake, in my view, is definitely the boat that we all devote too much time to the resolution at the beginning. We should spend much more time with setup and confrontation. Good, uh, then let me move to another point. You're, when you are giving a talk, I mean, when you are preparing a talk, 
what you are doing is translating a paper into a slides. Okay. I look at that at the same as the same process as going from a book to a movie script, right? And there are lots uh, of resources in the internet giving you good ideas about how to do this. Well, the first, the fundamental idea that uh, everybody will tell you is that this is a different medium. It's a different thing. You should not try to be literal when going from the book to the movie script. You have to transform many, many, many things. And in particular, of course, when you are going from a, a, a book to a movie or when you are going from a paper to, a, to a, a presentation, you are going from text to images and sound. In particular, for example, a fundamental point is this is, you are when you are reading text, you are getting information only through a channel. Here, you are getting information simultaneously from two channels. Okay, this is, for example, the first fundamental difference between the two. And you can start deriving lots of things from this. For example, never do this. Never copy a result from your paper and put it in your slide. Because it's a different, you want to achieve a different effect. Here you are trying to be precise. You are going to try, you should avoid any kind of inconsistency. When you are talking, you are doing something different. You want people to get a first impression. So in fact, you should never do this. You should, uh, whenever I, I, I look at, uh, when I, I'm always trying to see, okay, how could I make my presentation even more different from my paper? Right? So this is a good question to ask yourself all the time. For example, never start with a bunch of definitions. Okay? Uh, in fact, you know, movies have a very nice way of handling this. You know, in movies, you also need to give information to the audience about things. Okay? But people who uh, do movies, they spend a lot of time trying to hide that information. I don't know how many of you know what is a movie plant or what is a plant in movies. You know, the uh, standard example is the shot of a weapon, of a, for example, a weapon on the wall of the house of the protagonist, which uh, you, you need to, get, to have the information that this weapon is there because later on, you know, the, the, the protagonist is going to be assaulted and with the help of that weapon, something is going to happen. And you all know that if you notice that the reason of this shot is that one, that this shot is there only because later this is going to happen, you look at that as, okay, the uh, film director is not doing a good job. So we should learn about that. It's always possible to hide the definitions as plants. What people in movies do is they show you maybe this shot, but they pretend to be doing something else. For example, showing everything that is in the wall, okay? Presenting you with the, uh, how the, the, the wall of this person looks like. And uh, they are always presenting the information in a natural way, such that you don't even notice that you are receiving the information. And it's always possible to do quite a bit of that with definitions. So another, piece of advice is anthropomorphize. So transform abstract ideas into people or let people convey abstract ideas. So uh, uh, of course you are in very good company when you do this. You all know the example of the uh, uh, dining philosophers. That's exactly what Dijkstra was doing. He was treating actors, I mean the, the agents in a distributed algorithm, he pretends them to be people Okay, and he tries to find an everyday, a daily life situation, which makes sure that uh, you will, without noticing, right, get the formal definition of the system. Okay, by sitting people at the table and letting them and putting the forks in the middle, you immediately see the problem that, okay, they both are going to try to grab this fork. Okay, and you get it, you assimilate it because you immediately associate it with your daily life and uh, you don't need now the formal definition. You have already understood that. Uh, 
you know, of course, another example of anthropomorphization is uh, uh, all the questions about Alice and Bob or, or Mallory or, or Eve and uh, as an eavesdropper. You are also, of course, this is, of course, a, a, a very, very old technique. I mean, Plato was using it 2,500 years ago. You know that Plato wrote in the shape of dialogues. What he's doing is just putting abstract ideas in the mouth of people. Okay, people who are also given some characters that more or less resemble the ideas that that person is going to uh, um, defend or pursue. So, uh, and by the way, in case uh, Galileo Galilei was doing exactly the same thing. He was also writing dialogues about a uh, thousand years later, and in this case about very hard science, about physics. So there is no excuse in saying, oh, in philosophy maybe that's possible, but not in computer science. No, it is possible in computer science. I mean, if it's possible in physics, it's also possible in computer science. So let me just, uh, how much time do I have, Marie? Uh, there's 20 minutes left. I still have 20 minutes. Uh, including questions, ideally. Okay, including questions, because don't worry, I'm going to be faster than that. Okay, so let me just give you, because all this can look, of course, pretty, um, uh, pretty uh, generic and maybe not so uh, specific advice. Let me just show you how it works by taking, I, I have taken a presentation that I prepared a bit in a hurry in 2014, I think. It was the first presentation I made about uh, uh, some work that I was uh, starting to do on a model, which I hadn't invented, which was already uh, in place, called population protocols. And this was a, a presentation that clearly didn't work. You know, after I made the presentation, I got questions that uh, made clear that people hadn't understood the model, they didn't, uh, and they were quite puzzled. They hadn't really understood what was the result saying. And then I, uh, motivated by this, of course, and also because I had more time, then I prepared a new version, which I kept refining. So I will show you then how this changed in a second presentation uh, a couple of years later. So, uh, so this presentation was just following, it was very, very close, too close, far too close to the paper, right? It was saying, you know, this was something like the introduction of the paper, right? Uh, you were still trained by population protocols or a theoretical model for distributed computation by identical finite state mobile agents interacting pairwise. It was introduced by these people here and it has been applied to this and that. And then, uh, let me just start by introducing the syntax. Uh, a syntax is, a, 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 let me, first I introduce what is a population protocol scheme. It's a pair where the first element of the pair is a set of states. And then I was trying to give a little bit of intuition about this by saying that, well, you know, a transition looks like this and says that two agents meet in these two states, Q1 and Q2, can meet and move to these two the states. Of course, I, my purpose now is not that you understand that this model, right? I am present, I'm telling you uh, how I made it in my first presentation, I was very uh, unsatisfied with. Then you start, you, you give the semantics. This is again following the scheme of the paper. Okay, you describe the syntax, you describe the semantics, and then, well, I, this was, I still had to, this was still only the notion of uh, a, a population protocol scheme, and now you have to introduce what is the population protocol really, right? Which is a population protocol scheme plus some other things. And, uh, and uh, then you explain how you compute with population protocols, and that was it. Uh, and then I was trying to introduce, and then I was trying to introduce an example by trying to anthropom anthropo anthropomorphize a little bit, right? By trying to give an example where the agents in this uh, uh, population protocol would be debating computer scientists. But this example was rubbish because it was not getting the audience interested at all. And it was also not putting the audience in the frame of mind where they understand uh, uh, without having to look at the formal definitions where they understand what are the main issues with this, uh, with this model. 
So now let me tell you, uh, and then even some more rubbish, right? So now then let me tell you what happened, what this turned into after three years of uh, giving this talk. And, and, and in fact, this idea was already in place a couple of months after I gave the first talk, and then I kept refining it a little bit. So then I thought, okay, first of all, let's start with a riddle. Let's start with the idea. First, let's not present the example after the, uh, the formal definitions or the idea, the syntax and semantics. Let's do it earlier. Okay, let's try to find an example also, which uh, gives a little riddle to the audience. And this is what I came up with. And also let's try to find an example which puts the audience in the right frame of mind to understand the model. And this is what I came up with. I mean, population, there is, for example, there were population protocols in the literature whose purpose is to compute a majority function. So then you think, okay, what is, what is, what is a situation where people, where it is interesting for people to compute, to decide the majority function? You say, okay, a vote, a vote by majority. So I, I need people who are going to carry out the vote. But then immediately you have, you know that there are thousands of algorithms for, for carrying out votes. Raise your hands or, or just uh, put your uh, uh, ballots in, a, in, a, in an urn. And then you want to put them in a situation where they have to compute in the way in which population protocols compute, which is only there you can only exchange information when two people um, uh, meet when two people physically meet, the agents are moving around and they can only exchange information when they meet. So then you think, okay, let's talk about this uh, deaf black ninjas, a group of people who have to meet at some place in the dark. They don't see anything and they don't hear anything because they are deaf, right? And then immediately you have the riddle, right? You can tell the audience, how are you going to compute the boat? And people immediately get engaged. At least this has, I mean, I am telling you the reaction of people. Whenever I presented this, I noticed immediately, okay, people are paying attention. So then you give them the solution. You give the solution to the riddle. And in fact, while I was giving the solution, I was introducing the model. You don't say uh, there is a set of states. Here you, it was very natural to have four different states. You don't even, well, you mentioned the word state, but you would not even need to do it. Then you tell them which are the transitions, but you just tell them by tell them, telling them what they do, right? This is how the, the ninjas behave. And uh, uh, then, only then, after you have done all this, only then you start saying, what are population protocols good for, and so on. And only then you start introducing the formal definition, which by the way, I always, when I was giving the talk, I always had the impression, now this is not really so, so everybody has already understood it. The syntax, I could go very quickly through, and uh, the semantics, uh, I could present also with the help of pictures. I didn't have to use any text, and uh, then I could define, I needed in the end, a couple of lines telling you how a protocol computes something. Okay, so after I use, I, after I switched to this technique, I never got any question from the audience showing that they had misunderstood the, the, the model because I hadn't been clear. So everybody was now in the right frame of mind and they were getting the main ideas. Okay, so I think, uh, uh, so I am almost done. So I am going just to tell you a little bit about the second part. I, I have been telling you a lot about the fact that if you think that you are telling a story, then you are, there are immediately many consequences of that that you are going to start applying in your presentation. Okay, it is, uh, telling a story is different from making a speech and uh, it is different from teaching a lecture. But I think it is really the right thing to do when you are presenting your results. I don't think it's good, for example, to put you in the frame of mind of a teacher because the audience, they are not the students, okay? You are not talking to students. So you, have a, you should have a different uh, frame of mind. And uh, definitely, it, you are, it's not a speech. You are not trying to persuade anybody of anything. Or I think it's a bad idea to try to persuade anybody of anything when you are presenting a talk. Think 
about it as you are telling a story, you are trying to tell a good story. Now, okay, so uh, about the other part, you are an actor. So then act, okay? If you are an actor, act. Use your hands and body. And this is, for example, goes against the image of the newscaster. But I'm sure you have found this very often in a conference, right? People who stay behind their laptop, they move very little, and they consider themselves a voice and off voice. So what in, in, in movie terms would correspond to a voice in off, right? Somebody who is narrating, uh, on uh, telling you what is uh, on, the, on the screen, right? Uh, with the disadvantage that very often the screen is just something that doesn't change. And every movie director will tell you, never do that. Never show a screen in the screen, never keep the screen without anything moving. There is actually a very nice anecdote about, uh, or, or, or I've, tried, I've been trying to find the reference, but there was a very nice uh, interview with Francois Truffaut, the, the French director who was saying, well, I, once I had to, uh, 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 film a shot of a person in front of a coffin, kneeling in front of a coffin. And the problem was that nothing was moving in the frame. When the audience was seeing this, they were immediately looking away because nothing was moving. So actually, they, he put a candle there so that something moves, okay? Otherwise, people are immediately going to be distracted by something. Anyway, use your hands and body. Move, use a remote. Uh, I think if you don't, in order not to be just tied to your laptop, use a remote. Uh, interact with your slides. This is what I am trying to do here, right? There, I, uh, the best investment I've done in the last years is a tablet. It's a tablet that allows you to underline. Uh, again, things should move on the screen if you want to keep people's attention, right? Uh, follow the advice of movie makers. Um, draw attention to you when necessary. I mean, some people just put themselves, they want, of course, it's a good advice that not to obstruct the text, not to do like this, right? Not, uh, 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 not to let people read what is on the slide. But you know, they may not have to be able to read it all the time. Sometimes you want to attract the attention to you because you are the one who is explaining something and, and with your gestures, with your voice, with you can, convey the information better than what's in the screen. So sometimes you should just search for the light, right? And not just stay in a corner where nobody sees you. Something which I find quite important is interpret and comment. So this means do not only present your results, but keep a running commentary. And what does this mean? This means, for example, when you reach a difficult point, say so say, now this is a difficult point. Now, please pay a special attention because this is the core or this is a, a place where you could get it wrong, right? Or say, no, this is easy or this is very similar to something I, 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 some other people have done or this is the novel part. Keep a running commentary because the audience doesn't have that information. And doesn't, that information helps the audience to understand what uh, you are uh, to understand your results. So, and this is my last slide, right? In the end, uh, we all know that uh, when we are giving a talk, in particular, the couple of minutes before giving the talk, uh, they are awful, right? Uh, you are feeling very nervous, you are agitated, and you are thinking, oh gosh, this could, get, this could go wrong. Uh, well, but you know, Actors also have those feelings, but they learn to overcome them and they learn to enjoy the task. Okay, in particular, after a couple of minutes of, of, of uh, uh, once you are a couple of minutes in and you forget about those first impressions, then they really try to enjoy what they are doing. And because actually giving a talk is a privilege, right? So you have very interesting people, very clever people listening to you. And that's a complete privilege. That happens very rarely in life, right? So one should really enjoy it. And uh, I think that's all I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention.